little bit of YouTube. And on my phone this week, it's been popping up. <laughs> it's been popping up about the different Bibles. And now they're starting to say that the King James Bible is, since it's old writing, that the people nowadays need to have the writing changed in it so that they can understand it. They're, they're trying to deter people away from the writing of the King James Bible. And they're trying to get them for, for the Bible writers to accommodate today's people instead of the, today's people accommodate to the Bible. And, and it's every time I turn it on, it has something to do with different writings. And a lot of them are trying to deter the yeah. King James Bible. Yeah, they, uh, they, they, they don't like the Shakespearean English, uh, the, the, the Victorian old English uh, uh, terminology and, 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 and influence of, of, of that time in the scriptures. Uh, the, they try to say it's easier to understand if you have it in modern language. Well, the problem is all these versions that have come out since, oh goodness, um, 50s, 60s, uh, ever since really the NIV and some of them very hit the markets, but since then it's been numerous. Uh, and there's so many of them now, hard to keep up with them. And um, they, they've, got, they've gotten the Bible, what they say in an easier language, in a more everyday language, but people are not understanding it any better. They're not reading it anymore. Matter of fact, they're probably reading it less. And, uh, and so it doesn't have anything to do with the King James being hard to understand. It has everything to do, well, it, it has everything to do with the fact they're being told it's hard to understand and the fact they're not reading it. That's, that's the thing. Uh, you, you know, um, it's... of the world where everybody sees can't forget something that you've already seen. Right. And, and whenever Satan puts that little bitty seed yeah. in everybody's head, there's always that seed whenever they'll see it now that they're, yeah. they've are they heard something wrong about it. Yeah. And, and that's what Satan does. He doesn't just well, it's like make this. everybody a, a killer. I told somebody recently about the King James. They were doubting the King James and not, sort of not throwing down on the King James, but they made a derogatory mark that I didn't appreciate. And, uh, and when, the, when they said it, I, of course, I, not that God needs my defense of anything. He doesn't. His word stands for itself. But uh, I told them like this. I said, if the King James Bible is not the word of God, then we don't have the word of God. I said, so that's bottom line. If you can't trust it, you can't trust anything out there. I said, so you just need to tr read what, you, what, you, what you're reading and believe what you're reading. And it's not that hard to understand. Quit, quit saying it's hard to understand. It's not. Let me tell you something. If a dumb old country boy like me from Tobacco Sticks to North Carolina can read the Bible and get out of it, what I get out of it, anybody can read it and get something out of it. Okay. Yes, it is. It, it, it's not hard to understand. It's just in a it's just in a form of English, of that the old Shakespearean English, that we don't read anymore, and uh, that throws everybody off. You know, and it's you know I, I I really don't appreciate these new people out of seminary throwing off on the King James. I'll correct them in a heartbeat. I have no qualms with it at all. And uh, again, not that God needs my defense of anything. But I, I stand in defense of it, and I will. Well, wouldn't and uh, a different interpretation of it. Somebody trying to quote a verse, and it's not the King James Bible. Your ears just automatically think, "Well, what are they reading?" Yeah, it's not an interpretation; it's another translation. Mm -hmm. A translation. Yes, Miss Renee. What is what is the difference in the Gideon Bible and the King James Bible? Gideon's pass out King James Bible. And they pass out New King James Bible. They pass out New King James. Yes. But last time he was here, 
That's the reason that it's been two years since they've been here because last time he was here, he read out of something other than the King James. And that's the reason I stopped him. And the only reason I didn't say anything the night he was here is because I took the error on my side instead of their side. That I said I did not make myself clear. But trust me, I have made myself clear. And I said if it happens again, there won't be no, won't be coming back. You'll be, you'll be stopped and you'll be asked to sit down. That's the way it's going to be. So is the new King James Bible okay to read? The only Bible we have here is King James. I know, but I'm asking you. I would read, I would read the King James. But the Gideons have the new King James? I prefer the King James. I don't see anything wrong with it. If it ain't broke, don't need to fix it. And, uh, you know, even though my, one of my professors was the chief editor of the Old Testament of the New King James, I, 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 I still prefer the King James. And uh, uh, it's, and when you start bringing in other versions and, and, other, and other translations, you, you, you don't do anything but like Brother Mike says, just further on his point, you breed doubt and you don't have a standard and you know and, and and you put question marks in people's minds if you go to i know a pastor for example that he was going to preach out of a different version every week just because they're out there i don't know who to go listen to i'm not going to listen to it there, there's not a gideon bible the gideons are distributors of bibles okay they distribute is okay to read 90% 90, 90 of what they pass out are King James Bibles. They do have other translations. They do have the new King James that they pass out. And, uh, but most of the time, and 99% of the time, if you go to a hotel that still allows you to put them in there, it's going to be a King James Bible. Okay? And uh, every Gideon Bible I've ever seen in a hotel or a waiting room or anywhere else has been a King James Bible because I've read a bunch of them. <laughs> I go and I don't really generally take my Bible to the hospital, but I've sat in a lot of waiting rooms for a lot of hours. And I don't like to read the magazines that are 20 years old, so I read the Bible when they're there, okay? So uh, uh, that's, that's, that's what I do. I just pick up the Bible and read it. And, uh, and I really appreciate the Gideon Bible. And uh, who, who's over there? Oh, okay. You need Roger, brother LB? Okay. I didn't know what he needed. Oh, okay. Well, we 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 get we off track. We'll get it. This this uh, we need to have a word of prayer, and then um, then brother Roger can do his deal. That that's that's what it is. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Okay. All right, Father, we love you. Thank you, Lord, again for loving us and. Lord, taking good care of us, I pray today that you'll just guide us as we study your word. I pray that, Lord, you'll guide us in all truth. I pray you bless these that we've mentioned by name. You know the needs, and, Lord, there are a lot of them. But, Lord, you're a big God, and I pray that, Lord, you'll take care of each one according to thy will. For we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. And um, I have not, uh, I tell people like this, there's been a lot of, a lot of deception when it comes to different translations and different versions. We've never had an issue at Westside Independent Baptist Church. There's not going to be an issue at Westside Independent Baptist Church because the only Bible that's going to be used here is King James. And uh, that's just the way it's going to be. As long as I'm here, that's the way it's going to be. Uh, and, uh, and I've had a couple people over the years that have tried to bring in the controversy of other translations and I tell them and I as Paul as, as Paul was stood Peter face to face I stood I was stood them face to face and I've told them I said when you when you know as much Greek and Hebrew as I know then we can have the discussion I said until then there is no discussion and uh, and you know what I say in that matter goes and uh and, and, I, and, and I know that sounds dogmatic because it is. And that's the way it's going to be. Uh, I, ha I, did a, I did a version. I, I had this conversation with somebody recently. Um, and I, I, it's like this. I did a version analysis 
one of the things I had to do in the introduction to biblical ex exposition was I had to do a, a version analysis. In the version analysis, we had to take four different passages of Scripture, two from the Old Testament, two from the New Testament, and we had to look at all four passages in 13 different translations, plus and including the Greek and the Hebrew. And then we had to write a paper on each one of those passages in each translation. Now, you do the math. That's a lot of work, okay? I, had some, I got it somewhere. It was in a filing cabinet. It was probably about that thick when it was all done. It was thick. And it was amazing out of a, probably the 30-plus people that were in that class that did the same assignment. What, and then we had to rank at the end of the day. We had to rank the translations in order as we saw that were more, uh, they were literal to the Greek and Hebrew. They were, you know, consistent in their Greek and Hebrew. And, and there were several criteria that we had to use to see, okay, was it consistent with the wording, literal? Was it consistent, you know, throughout the, the translation and through that kind of thing? When that, when that assignment was over, 100% of the class put the King James Bible number one. 100%. Even those that didn't even ascribe to the King James put it number one. And uh, so that, that, in, that was one exercise that, uh, that, that solidified me in saying this. Plus... I saw once the versions were, were introduced to the churches what it did. And one word that is associated with the version uh, issue, I guess you'd say, for lack of a better term, is confusion. Wouldn't you agree? Confusion. And, uh, and the Bible says that God is not the author of confusion. So if something is brought in and it brings confusion, then it can't be of God. Amen? Got me? Makes sense? And uh, don't let everybody, anybody doubt you or doubt, make you doubt that you can hold the King James Bible up and this is the inspired, infallible, inerrant word of Almighty God. It is preserved for us today. Everything in it, from Genesis to Revelation, is absolutely 100% true. And, I, and there's no reason for anybody to doubt it. The, the, everything that this book says up to this point in time since it's been written that said it's going to happen has happened. Amen. Only a fool would say that the rest of the things in there that hadn't happened yet it's not going to happen. So that's where I am with it. Okay? And, uh, and I, this is a devil's attempt to get people, just like devil did in the, in the Garden of Eden, the only, thing devil, the, devil, the only thing the devil has to do with human nature is plant a seed of doubt and let the mind do the rest. That's all he's got to do. And that's what, exactly what he did to Eve when he went to Eve and said, Did God say... That's what he said. That's that, that's what he gave. He put out a doubt, and that's what people are doing today. I, I, more and more people I'm hearing of these younger generation that are coming around. I don't believe in God. You can't tell me that the Bible's not true. Well, let me tell you something. Go back. Did is not the Bible true up to this point in time? They can't argue with that. It's true. Then who are you to say it's not going to be true afterwards? That so, but a person that doesn't believe it, you can't make them believe it. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Um, it, it just popped up on my phone this week. Well, I, I took it with everything else that has happened this week, like with uh, everybody heading to Texas. It, and you've said it before, all this stuff is a camouflage for what they're doing behind the scenes. So what I was talking about, this um, trying to put down the King James and other things that are happening 
It, it's the dark side that are putting all these thoughts out in everybody's mind. There's no way I, I, I'd care anything about anything else but a King James Bible. And in fact, you say in your dogmatic, that, that's just plain and simple. It's a King James bar none. You know, that, that's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, a sleight of hand. Uh, you know, watch what I'm doing over here. Don't just ignore what I'm doing over here. This thing, this stuff's been going on in church a long, long time, and I've, and I've, I've been around the fights. And uh, I'm just that's just a fight I've never chosen to fight, and I'm not going to fight it because it's not going to be an issue. Um, and I, I have through the years, I've asked people to leave that brought that issue into the church, and uh, and, and and I'm. I'm I'm just, I'm really dogmatic about it. And because uh, part of my job as a shepherd of the flock is not only to teach the flock, but to protect it as well. And uh, I will do that when it comes down to that. I will do it and will not apologize for it. If it hurts feelings, it ain't hurt feelings, that's fine. I wasn't hurt, but some other folks were. And, uh, but that's, that's okay. I mean, that's what comes with the territory. Satan loves nothing but come in to steal, to kill, and destroy. That's right. That's what he wants to do. And uh, I'm not going to let somebody come in and cast doubt upon a book that's true. And, uh, and, 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 and that. And I mean, you can't find any inconsistencies in it. And, you know, if there, you do find an inconsistency in it, it's not an inconsistency in the book. It's an inconsistency in your mind understanding the book. <laughs> so it, that, that, that's what I've learned over the years. Okay. It's not the book's fault, mine. Okay, all right. And uh, well, let's get into this thing about Melchizedek just a little bit more. And I uh, hope you've been reading chapter seven and eight. And uh, we, we've talked. About, we want to look at the un, undeniable, undeniable legality of Christ as priest. The undeniable legality of Christ as the priest. Now, remember last week we talked about the Arianic priesthood uh, was the legal priesthood. That's what God set up. That's what God worked through. And Christ is a, is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. So there has to be a change in the program in order for him to be the legal priest. Okay? So chapter 7 is going to explain to us the change that took place. And, and, and of course, the why is because in order for Christ to be priest and king and to be legally priest, he asked there had to be a change in the program. Okay? Um, it's just like the birth of Christ. Just go back to the birth of men and I'll, I'll compare the two. The birth of Christ. You know, when you go back to David and you go back to Solomon, and you, after Solomon, the, 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 the kingdom divided. You have the, the divided kingdom. You have... Israel and the capital Samaria. You had Jerusalem, uh, and you know, or Judah with the capital being Jerusalem. So you you had the, the the two divided kingdoms, which had their own kings, and on that. But it noticed that the fact that the, the the seed itself that was talked about in Genesis three verse fifteen, the seed of the woman, and that's what was being argued about there. When God told uh, when 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 God told the serpent that look you know you'll bruise his heel but he'll bruise thy head talking about the seed of the woman that's the proto evangelium the first mention of Christ in the scriptures Genesis three fifteen you you have then you have a war on the seed you have a war on the lineage you have a you have, and so the devil a, a few times a couple times. Throughout Scripture, and, and this is easy, don't blurt it out, raise your hand, uh, you, you, have, you, you have a war on the seed. The first time that there was a war on the seed and a decree was made to kill all Hebrew children, who made, who, who, what was that, when was that decree made? The first time. No, not the first time. Yes, sir. Pharaoh, when he made the when when he when he made the decree, and uh, when they made the decree of killing all the Hebrew children under two, 
And that's the reason didn't Moses' mother put him in a, ba in a, in a, in a basket in the bulrushes and put him in the ri river, right? To protect what? Protect the seed. You go back and look, you protect the seed. He goes all the way through. Then God, after the, then God divided the kingdoms. Why did he do that? To confuse it. Because of the fact is, Joseph went through one line and Mary went through the other. If you, if you go back and look at the lineage, Mary went through, the, went through the one line and Joseph went through the other. They came back into one in Christ. When was the second time that the seed, that the seed was going to, be to try to be destroyed? Come on, Mike. That was when Herod made the decree and, uh, and, and, and to kill all Hebrew children under two because he was going based on what the wise men were telling him. I'm here, I'm here to see the king of the Jews. See, what, what would make him the king? The lineage. Okay? So we're going to kill all Hebrew children under two. That way we'll be sure to get him. Okay? But what did God, God protected him by sending him to what? Egypt, remember? Okay, so you, you, you got that, then you got the protection of the seed. All right? So that's the reason that when you read the Gospels, you have two lineages in the Gospels. When you read Matthew's Gospel and you read Luke's Gospel, you have two completely different genealogies. Well, you say, well, why do we have two? You've got to have two. If you don't have two, then Christ is not literally and legally the king. So, let me ask a question. Y'all know the answers. Just think about it. Who, and I'm talking about parents, so you've got a 50-50 shot here. Who gave Christ his divine right to the throne? In other words, he's going to be the king forever after David. And, I, and, and who gave him that authority for the divine, D-I-V-I-N-E, right, to the throne? Mary. That came through Mary. Because Mary is a direct descendant from David. Okay? Well, that's all said and good. But in those times, you didn't get your, your, your legal right to the throne. Through your lineage, you got it through your daddy. Well, they're not going to recognize the virgin birth. So Joseph is the daddy. And so Joseph is the one, and since there's only one left, I'll answer it for you. Joseph is the one that gave him his legal right to the throne. That's what allows him to take the throne and be legal in it. Because it's the fact that there's a legal and a divine right. So it's similar here with Christ and the, and, the, and the priesthood, same thing. It's just a different office. You got the king, now we're talking about the priest. You, okay, the divine right, he's got the divine right through the order of Melchizedek. And uh, God said that he's the priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Well, that's not the way God wrote the scriptures in the Old Testament because it came through the Arianic priesthood, through the tribe of Levi. Now Christ is the tribe of Judah. We've got some conflicts here we've got to, we got to solve. Well, Hebrew solves this, solves this for us. Okay? And so that's what, that's, and I try to explain it that way so that everything makes sense, okay? And we're not going to get much into it today, but we'll, I, I, maybe we'll wet your whistle, so to speak, uh, again, about it again. Look at verse 11 of chapter 7. The Bible says, If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, and then in parenthesis, for under it the people received the law. What further need was there that another priest should rise after the order, okay, of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? So it asks the question, doesn't it? It asks the question. For the priesthood being changed. See that? Being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe. 
tribe of Judah, not tribe of Levi. Got me? Aaron, tribe of Levi. Christ is not a, a priest after the order of Aaron because he's not of the Levitical tribe. He's of the tribe of Judah. Okay? He says, of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning the priesthood. And it is yet far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest. In other words, the, Paul is saying in Hebrews, two things are evident. It's evident that Jesus is out of the tribe of Judah. And Moses didn't speak nothing about it. And the second thing that's evident is that we've got another priest that's after another tribe. Those two things are factual. Now, the question is how they reconciled. There's the, there's the key. Then it says, Who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life? For he testifieth, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. That is a direct quote from Psalm 110, verse 4. And I told you that's only the second time in the, in the, in the Old Testament that Melchizedek is found. It's found in, in Psalm 110, verse 4. So, what, it's not by carnal commandment, it says, but for thereafter the similitude of Melchizedek, there shall rise another priest who is made not after the law of carnal commandment, but after the power of of an endless life, let's go on to read in verse 18, for there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before the weakness and the unprofitableness thereof. For the law made nothing perfect. See, the law was not the better deal. The law was, was the best that could be done under fleshly things. But it was a continual thing that had to be done all the time because it wasn't perfect. It didn't bring about an end. It, it was continual. That's the word. It was continual. It didn't solve anything. It, it, it just covered something up for a time. And, and, and the word here, not perfect. It wasn't complete. But there's something that is complete. Okay? It says, for the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did. The bringing in of a better hope did. Who is that? That's Jesus. When, when God brought Jesus in, there was a better hope. It made something perfect, complete, through. It, come about, it brought about an end. By the which we draw nigh unto God. Verse 20. And as much as not within an oath, he was made priest. For those priests were made without an oath. But this with an oath. By him that said unto him, The Lord, go back to, go back to what I mentioned this one time before, maybe about two or three weeks ago. Is that the Lord swear will not repent? Thou art a priest after the order of Melchizedek. By so much was Jesus made a surety of the better testament. When God who when God swore, who did God swear by? Remember that I talked about it. Himself. Why? Because there's no greater than to swear than by Himself. So we don't have it by the law of of a carnal commandment. But Moses wrote, we have it based on a verbal declaration from an endless life that you had to meet a criteria. You didn't have no beginning, no end. Jesus meets the criteria. Melchizedek shows that criteria because there was no beginning of days, no end of days. And so he's a priest after the order of Melchizedek. 
of which God changed by his verbal command and swore an oath to it that this is the way it is. Because this priesthood brings about a completeness, a, a better hope, a ending to something. See, that's the reason it's so important, these little verses that we quote. You say, well, John the Baptist comes on the scene in John chapter 1, and, and he says, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. Why was that phrase so important? Because the law never took it away. The law covered it. That's all it did was covered it. But when Jesus came, because of who he was, and because he was the great high priest, by God, by declare, declaration of God Himself and swore an oath to it to Himself. When Jesus died, He took all those other sacrifices that had ever been killed and brought them all to culmination in His one sacrifice. And what those sacrifices could not do, Jesus' perfect blood did. And that is he died and took our sins away. Didn't cover them, took them away. There's a difference. There's a difference. That, now, now, now let me bring this back into a practical thing and then we'll go. You and I get saved by faith. We accept Christ, what he did for us on the cross of Calvary, right? We get saved, right? Right? And the Bible says we have what? Everlasting life or eternal life, right? But you got all these free will Baptists and all these Pentecostals and all these other church of God and all these other folks out there that say, oh, no, the Calvinists too. You can lose your salvation. You can lose your salvation. If you sin, you're going to lose your salvation. Hold up. You're still under the law, man. The law covered it. When I got saved, Jesus didn't cover it. He took it out of the way. Amen. He took it away. He put it in the depths, as the psalmist puts it, he puts it in the depths of the deep blue sea, promising never to remember it again, number one. Number two, he's going, how far is he going to put my, feet, my sin away from me? From the north to the west, south? No, because you go north long enough, you'll go south again. If you go south far enough, you'll go north again. But if you go east, you always going east. If you go west, you always going west. There's never a time you going east. God said, I'm going to put your sins far as the east is from the west, promising to never to remember them again. And then when, why? Because when Jesus saved me, he took my sins away, didn't cover them up to be brought back against me at a later time. You see how all that takes place in the, in the, in the priesthood? Why it's so important? Because he's a better hope. He's a better high priest. And he's legally the high priest because God said he was and swore by himself that he would be. That's why. And we see it right here in the book of Hebrews. Is that, you know, so we, we have a change in that priestly ordinance. And uh, the tribal descent changed. The title deed changed. That's from verse 12. If you go back up and read for the, uh, verse 12 through verse 14, the title deed changed. And the reason for the change was to enable Christ to be the priest legally. Okay? Legally. All right. Keep reading Hebrews. And we'll pick up there later again. One more again. Yes. Hallelujah. 